So welcome back, everyone. I'm very happy that I have this nice spot after the break. I hope you're all refreshed. I'm going to talk to you about uh, internationalization um, in Elm and how you can uh, add more languages uh, uh, to your Elm app and how our approach allows you to treat localized, so translated text, uh, just as a constant. My name is Fies Amaru. Uh, I work at a small um, de development agency based in Cologne, Germany. We mostly do mobile apps and. Uh, so coming from a Swift and Objective-C and Java Kotlin background, uh, we really enjoyed having like type safety uh, on the web as well, and that pulled us towards Elm. Um, and so starting right off, um, there are basically two approaches to uh, treating or uh, handling language switching um, in your Elm apps. You can either do it at runtime, which I'll be introducing shortly, but our approach is that you can switch it at compile time, um, which gives you some nice advantages that I will come to later. So before coming into our approach, how we do this at compile time, uh, I want to briefly outline ways that uh, you can use to and approaches that are uh, online um, about how to switch the language at runtime. So the basic setup is that if you switch at, at runtime, you'll need to keep the current user's language somewhere in your app model. Um, then you have your Rosetta Stone, so the translation function that you provide with an identifier of what you want to translate, and then the language um, into what you want to translate that identifier, and then you get a string, a localized string back. And that requires you to pass through uh, the language uh, from your main application entry point down to the lowest functions where you'd need to localize something. So either you can pass around the entire app model that somewhere includes the language, or it adds another argument to each function. Um, and at the end, you'll get one monolithic build that contains all languages, and um, let's call that all JS. Um, so that's the basic setup. And one example that's outlined on the Jizra blog, um, you'd have your, um, your, your type um, at the top, your language, your uh, union type that describes all available languages. You have then some translation ID um, that gives you all the available uh, words and tokens, like the name of the login button, what to, uh, how to welcome people. You have your translation function that takes the language, the translation ID, and returns the translated string. And then in your views, you would provide the language so that you can access the translation function and provide all the things you need. Um, so it's a very easy setup. It's easy to grasp. Um, the downside of that being um, so then. So in addition to the inherent drawback that you need to keep the language of the user in your app model and pass this around, this is, I think, the inherent drawback. The other drawback is that a monolithic build entails um, monolithic versions. So whenever you add a new function, um, that function needs to be added to all languages at the same time. And you can't roll out uh, an English version 1.1 first, and then later on add the feature in other languages too. You have to roll it all in lockstep. Uh, all versions have to move forward in lockstep. And depending on how many languages you support and how much localized strings you have, it also increases the, the builds. Um, so if you have uh, six languages, um, and that's not uncommon, for example, for Switzerland, if you have a Swiss app, uh, it have, has e only nationally, it would have four languages. Um, um, so that inc can increase the, the build size somewhat. Um, so these are some of the drawbacks. Um, some of the drawbacks can be tackled um, if you if you load them uh, load the translation dictionary um, later on uh, via JSON. But the problem then is that it's not type safe. So um, you, you can't ensure that the JSON contains all the strings that you want to translate. They might be missing. Some of them might not allow you to replace uh, placeholders. Um, so I'm not really a huge fan of this um, because it's just another request, and it, 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 it's, it's not the, it doesn't feel like it's the Elm way. Um, so we, we think it's, it's much nicer to do this at compile time. Um, and the approach is then basically that you um, have one build per language. Instead of this old JS, you have one English JS, one Norwegian JS, one German JS. Um, there are other ways of introducing maybe a, 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 a monolithic build as well in our approach, um, in our tooling, but let's stick to that for, for now. And then you simply use constants for the localized strings and functions if you have patterns like hello Felix or hello Oslo Elm. Um, then you'd have like a function. But they can be really, really simple because you only have to think about one language at a time. And then you just serve localized builds. Um, 
So the way that we propose to structure your, um, your Elm project is that you have your source folder with your main, uh, main Elm app and your views and everything that, that goes along with it. And next to it, um, you have a translation folder. And in there, you have one translation folder per language. And the trick is, basically, as you can see here, um, you would assume that in Elm world, uh, the module name would be translation.en.main. But we drop the, we omit the language from the modules. And so that basically allows us to just have, that's basically the whole magic of this whole talk, uh, comes from, from this little trick. Um, and, and then how you do this, how does it compile? You add a symlink to the language that you currently want to compile in or that you actually currently work in. And, and then you, if you want to change the language, well, all you do is change um, the symlink and you don't have to touch any of your source files um, because the import statement just reads import translation.main and exposing everything, and then you have access to the translation functions and all that. So that's really, really easy. And I, I will come to the tooling. We've provided some tooling to make switching easier if you're not familiar with how to do the symlinks, and I always confuse which way they go, if it's the target first and the source. I, I, I've written a small script to do that, and it also clears out the cache to not accidentally have some, some other translations lingering around. Um, so that's the basic approach. And then the, um, the, the, the implementation of the translation is really, really simple uh, if you know the Elm syntax. Um, so you just have a constant for strings that have no placeholders in them. Um, you have a functions if you have something like a name in there. And then the English version is just another file, and it looks basically the same. Uh, all that changes is the localized parts, as you would expect. So how do you switch languages? Um, I, I already said it's, it's basically a symlink. So switching a language is quite easy. You have uh, a, we've developed, uh, published a small NPM tool. Um, so you just type elm i18n switch, and then the language identifier. And then you can compile them as well. So the same tool that you use for switching is just for local compi compilation. If you want to quickly de um, um, just switch language and output a localized version of your build into a certain directory, you'll just append output, and it, it'll compile um, uh, to dist, to the dist directory, a no and an enjs file. And it does so fairly quickly, because all that is done between compiles is just we, we clear out the language cache symlink, and so the majority of the files have, n none of the files have changed, so you only uh, recompile uh, the one module or the two modules, or however many translation modules you have. And so compilation should be really fast, and then serving is really straightforward. Just have, however you do this on, 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 your, on your front end, you can either include, have en.html, or you, you can do it server side and exchange the, the things, so it's quite easy. So that, that, that starts the, the look at the tooling, but the tooling that really makes, um, makes um, our approach shine, I think, is that we provide imports and exports from and, to, from and to CSV to Elm and from and to Elm to posturing files. So because the, the file that I showed earlier, here it, it, it helps you understand what happens here, but a translator who, who knows a lot more about the culture of, and, and the languages that you want to um, expand into, does not know what this means. So um, we want to be able to work with translators a lot better, um, and, and that's why we've, we've provided some tooling. So you can simply export. Um, you can start by, your Elm, by writing your Elm code, um, and then you can generate a CSV file from your existing Elm code, um, and that'll just generate an, a CSV file that looks about like this. So it has a first column is a module, then the key, a comment that should help the, the translator understand the context of where the button is used. So if you just have login, it might be the name of the button, it might be the title of the page, and it might be the subject line of uh, some other, other email. Um, so to provide us a bit of context, because in some languages, the same word in English might be different words in other languages. So it's, it's good, good to provide some context. And then it has placeholders, and at the end, the translation. And so this can be generated from your Elm code, but more importantly, you can get the CSV file back from your translator or your marketing people who've decided that the buy now button should better be just buy immediately button. And, and it, it doesn't matter to you. And you, you, you don't get frustrated by changing your Elm code all the time because it's, it's just a one-time process. Um, and the same is true for profiles. Uh, profile is a format that is used widely in open source projects. Um, 
And so the, the, the nicety about why we have post strings is that a lot of online services and apps that help trans, um, collaboration with, um, with translators um, support importing post strings into their own um, 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 proprietary um, systems. And so you can use that to, um, to exchange um, translations with um, translators. And as you can see, uh, we are smart about, um, if you can see here, it says a percentage uh, and then brackets name, brackets s. That's the way to represent a placeholder in PostString. And in CSV, we invented our own, which is just the uh, handlebars. Um, and so importing back um, is very similar. Uh, you just say import language DE in a format PO from the export.po file, and then it generates for you uh, a new set of, of, of ELM, ELM files that you can just copy and paste in over your existing ones, and that's basically it. So I want to quickly jump into the elephant in the room. Um, the main drawback, obviously, if you switch the language at runtime, is you can't switch it at compile. Uh, sorry, if you uh, switch language at compile time, you obviously can't switch it at runtime. Um, so you can, but you have to reload the page, and that means you would have to restore the state. Um, first of all, I think that if you restore the state, it's good even for single uh, language apps. You should restore the state to a sensible location in your app. So that's a good thing to do, this, no, no matter if you're translating or not. So that's something you should do anyways. Um, and then a reload, OK, it's a bit of a suboptimal user experience. But if you are seeing that many users switch the language, you're doing it wrong. So you should make an educated guess um, about what language the user would want to see. And then hopefully less than 5% of the users will be required to look for the, for the change language button. So I don't think that it's a huge use case. And, and so the benefits in our mind overweigh. And there's an issue. If you want to help and co um, contribute to our project, um, um, there's an issue how we can uh, tackle this maybe as well. So let's come to the advantages. Um, uh, so first of all, it's really, really simple. The other translation functions usually have huge switch case statements. Um, and, and here it's just really, really simple uh, functions to read and to use as well. So you ha have no, um, you, you, your app can be language agnostic, so the language of the user doesn't appear in your app's code. And so you just have translation greeting Richard, and that's about it. Um, it also is fully type safe. And depending on, 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 the, um, on the IDE or the editor that you use, you also get, also get auto completion. So if you use um, something like a JSON for the lookup, you have just keys, and you have to look up the keys and make sure you don't have a typo in your key. That can't happen here, because you can have auto completion, and if, if it, it doesn't exist, it doesn't compile. So that's quite nice. And contrary to the other one, um, to, the, to, the, to the runtime approach, you can also have phased rollouts and, and have start developing quickly with your own language. Then you can add new features uh, to some languages first, and then you can expand the support for new features as the translations come in. Or in our case, mostly the product owner decides on the final wording of the buy button. Um, and so when, once he's really confident that that's the perfect language, that, then you can roll that out. And it's also very safe, because incomplete translations do not compile. So you can't accidentally forget, ah, I also have Bukmal and Nynorsk. Uh, so I always forget to add the, uh, to add the, the label to both. Um, so that's really cool. Um, it also allows for much better testing, because you can just invent a pseudo language. So let's say you have view tests and HTML view tests. You can just switch to the language test, which is stable across product owners. So one product owner says, buy now. No, it should be buy, exclamation point. And so you can just have a, 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 a stable set of tests because you have your own pseudo language. And then you can easily add, like, oh, how does the, the button behave um, if I have a very long name? Does it get eclipsed correctly? Um, uh, does it get truncated correctly? Um, so all this can be easily used by having just a, a, a nice set of tests um, with a test language or, or multiple test languages. Um, yeah. And for us, mainly, it was that the, the driving factor was that it's easy to collaborate with um, external um, translators and product owners because you can provide them with a CSV file if they're unfamiliar with anything. You can provide them with a postering file if they're professional um, computer, tra um, computer software translators. Um, and it allows you to add new languages really, really easily because none of the code base changes. You have, if you add a new language, it's just a folder that appears somewhere, and you have no changes to existing files. So that's basically a wrap. Um, um, as I said, 
Right now we have CSV and, uh, and, and post strings. Um, if you want to contribute, you're more than welcome to contribute. Um, um, we can, one of the easiest avenues to start working on is adding another export format. That's really easy. We, we, are, we are designed to do that. So you can have add, add your JSON ex exporter. Uh, or XLIF would be really cool, because XLIF is also one of the standard formats in which translators exchange um, uh, strings. Adding support for plurals is also really cool because different languages support different numbers of plurals. So in, in German, you'd have zero, one, and many as different types of, of multiples. So no, no, nobody, one person, many persons. Um, but in Russian, you have uh, zero, one, less than 10, more than 10, more than 100, I, I guess. So you have different kinds of plurals. And, and that could all be done. And PostString has ways of expressing this in the format, and it's easy to do in code as well. Um, so having this kind of import would be also a cool uh, pull request. Um, and then if, if you're really unhappy with the drawback that it, you can't switch at runtime and you absolutely need this, uh, we have considered adding like a, a, another comp compilation target um, that adds another step and has like a, a wrapper across it to allow you to do both. So um, I have a few minutes left. Um, I can maybe quickly try a demo. Um, let's see if that works. <coughs> so um, where's my cursor? Uh, cursor, cursor, cursor. Ah, oh, there I am. Um, this, the, that's the translation. Um, I have a really, really simple app. Um, it just says title here, so nothing spectacular. The app looks really promising, and we launch it soon. Um, so change the language is just um, uh, let's do this the way the right way. So changing to German is really easy. Uh, I copy this and I paste it here. I reload the page. It says Spiel. So it's, it's really easy to do. Um, so that's easy, obviously. Um, I can also um, switch back to English for now. Uh, and then I can export the postering files. And if you look, look, look on the left, um, you'll see that a, a, a postering file appeared that mimics what I have here, memory game and warning plus label. And so it's just one file for two translation modules. Um, so you, you're free to have as many translation modules as you like. Um, and they can match your other modules. Um, so you don't have one huge translation file. Um, and then if you want to go back and make changes in this here, um, just as an exclamation point here because it's cool. And then I can make some changes and import that back. And you see that it created an import here from that. The ordering is a bit different. Um, so there's an exclamation point, so I can just copy that over. And, and then I would be good to go. So it's really, it's, it's really easy to do a full circle, uh, export the profiles to a translator, get a postering file back, and, and make hundreds of changes at, at the same time. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, so, thanks in 100 languages. Um, I'm Felix at, on, on Slack. So if you have questions, I have a radar. So um, whenever you just type in anywhere in Slack, I18N or translation, uh, I would get notified. So uh, <laughs> you, you just have to, like, it's a bad, bad sign. Just, just type in I18N, and I'll, I'll come to the rescue. Um, or ping me directly. Um, I'm Felix Amru at uh, Twitter. Um, our company website is here, and you can find um, us on the GitHub repository. And I also published the core of the parser um, on, on Elm uh, package, so you can also find it via there. But it's just an npm install, and you don't need to do anything else. Yep. So that's it. <laughs>